Hello, everyone. Welcome to another international relations capsule for the Shankar Academy. Today, we'll discuss the gun laws in the United States because of a recent incident which has shocked the world. Even the middle of a war in which the United States is involved. A shooting incident in a school shocked not only the Americans, but also all people around the world. And once again, as it happens, the focus is on why this keeps happening in the United States all the time. Of course, I'm not going to give you the statistics, but it's very clear for all of us that very often we, are, we wake up with the news that a young madman has got into a school and shot a number of children and teachers. And then suddenly everybody is shocked and everybody starts asking questions as to how this happens. Why is it that there is no control over the gun laws? How is it that anybody can buy a gun when he cannot buy a, a medicine which is a prescription one? So it is easier to buy a gun than buy a, medic a medicine is what people speak or say about the United States. So there is a focus for some time and everybody discusses issues. Everybody says this should be changed, the gun laws should be changed. And then slowly everyone forgets it till another incident happens in another corner of the United States. So why is this happening? And the President of the United States, Joe Biden, spoke passionately, spoke almost desperately uh, by asking, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? So this is the President speaking, the most powerful man in the United States. He's saying that when in God's name will you be able to stand up to the gun lobby? So which means the President is admitting that the gun lobby is more powerful than him. But he's not the first one to say this. Successive presidents, whenever such incidents have happened, have, have wondered why this cannot be rectified. How come that the gun laws are not restricted? And every time this is forgotten, hoping that such a thing will not happen, but people merrily carry guns around and the statistics show that virtually everyone has a gun in the United States. Of course, there are many, many laws relating to gun for possession and use of guns in the US. Not that there are no laws, but the fundamental position arises out of the second amendment to the constitution. There are several versions of the amendment written in different ways with commas in different places, etc. But basically, it says as follows, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So this amendment has been read in various ways in different courts of law. Because as you in the United States, it's not a uniform law in every state. Different states have different legal frameworks. But of course, there is a federal Supreme Court uh, which determines the final interpretation of the law. So this particular amendment has two aspects to it. It speaks of a militia being necessary for a state, for any, any state uh, to protect the right of the people. So then immediately after that, it says, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So this was interpreted by different states. But finally, in 2008, the Supreme Court affirmed for the first time that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to possess firearms independent of service in a state militia and to use them for traditionally lawful purposes such as self-defense within the home. So if this Second Amendment is related to uh, official 
agencies like militias or army, etc. Then it makes sense. And that is why some people read it. Because as part of the militia or as part of the army, which is necessary for a nation, people should have the right to use arms. But then the interpretation given by the Supreme Court in 2008 gives it a different meaning. That is, regardless as to whether you are a member of a militia or not, whether you are a part of the law and order structure or not, you have the right to keep and bear arms. And the purpose also, the Supreme Court ruled that um, this is for the uh, traditionally lawful purposes of arms, such as self-defense within the home. So which means that the fundamental right to carry our arms and to use them for self-defense has been guaranteed by the Constitution. And any change you have to bring into this will mean another amendment to the Constitution, a big debate. And nobody, no president has been able to manage that. And under this protection, the sale and possession of arms is perhaps the most liberal in the United States. And not only that, this has been used. So you can imagine having some kind of a law which is helpful to criminals but it can all be dealt with in specific cases, that is true. But here what happens is that because of this general amnesty as it were, the general permission given to the people to indiscriminately possess arms without any restrictions. Of course, there are several restrictions imposed by the states, but all these restrictions cannot infringe the right of the people to bear arms. This is very different from most countries of the world. Because in most cases, you need a license. You cannot just buy a gun off the shelf in most countries. And even if you buy a gun, then you are, uh, you are kept under watch as to what you need it for. And so there are so many restrictions. But that doesn't mean that people don't get killed in other countries. In India also, we have so many crimes. Of course, since they don't have guns, sometimes use other methods like using even a python or a snake uh, to kill someone. So the human, the, the human tendency to take lives of others is something which is not possible to describe because no other species of animals kill their own species. They kill others, but they don't kill their own species. But it is only human beings who kill other human beings for whatever purpose. And therefore, it is necessary for them to be controlled and the possession of weapons should be strictly controlled in order to avoid this. Whether it will prevent such actions by mad people who go into a school and kill innocent children, that's a different matter altogether. But generally, there is a feeling all around the world that uh, these should be changed. But as it happens, no president, however powerful, uh, can make any, any change in the system. There is some background to all this. So first of all, you know that the American Revolution was an armed revolution, the freedom struggle in the United States, unlike in India. It was a free war for freedom. So there is a basic aspect that it was by fighting a war that the United States became independent. So there is a certain affinity towards the use of force, even in other circumstances. Secondly, the uh, people who came from UK and other countries to the United States, uh, first, to when, first went to very, uh, urban, very uh, rural areas, basically literally, places without people, without human beings. They were migrating and they had to find places where they could settle down. And they started with a struggle against wild animals in these areas to control them in order to settle down. So it became necessary, almost 100% of the people, migrants, etc., kept armed to fight the animals. And uh, even today, there is this danger, and that's why you find that 
And the majority of the people in the rural areas possess weapons, while those in the cities possess fewer weapons. But there is no great uh, concession because so the numbers are, are very, very, very large. And then another aspect to it is the, uh, are the laws of the UK where fundamental rights were very significant. And uh, those were also brought into the United States uh, Constitution. So there are some historical reasons for this. And therefore, in the Second amend Amendment was this written was this was written in a mild manner, linking it to a person being part of a militia. And afterwards, after several interpretations and several laws by the courts in different states, the Supreme Court finally ruled that this is not related only to the militias and the right to bear arms, is the word used, keep and bear arms. And specifically in order to, for self-defense and uh, maintaining the rule of law. So this is the real situation. But what happens in the United States, like for example, the situation is such that uh, the most powerful country in the world cannot discipline its own citizens against the uncontrolled spread of guns across the country. Parents in the US cannot send their children to school with the confidence that they will come, come back alive. And in the circumstances, even the president can only pray, as Mr. Biden did, God bless America, as his citizens are convinced that they are safe only if they are armed. So in a country where the people feel that it is necessary to be armed to be safe, it is very difficult for any president or any Congress to change it. And as I mentioned, the Second Amendment of the US Constitution gives Americans the right to bear arms. And about a third of American adults say they personally own a gun. But there was a lack of clear federal court ruling defining the right until the US Supreme Court ruled that the law protects any individual's right to keep and bear arms unconnected with service in a militia for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. So in the latest incident, as you may have heard with shock a few days ago, an 18-year-old boy, Salvador Ramos is his name, opened fire and killed at least 19 children most of them under 10, and two teachers at a primary school in Uvalde, Texas. A week prior to that, another 18-year-old killed 10 people at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York. The scenes were familiar, as it had happened many times before in different parts of the United States. Every time, everyone is agitated and determined to legislate new gun laws but give up their efforts even before the last dead body is buried and the last blood stains are washed away. The next reminder comes when another group of innocent children fall victims to another gun in another corner of the country. Of course, much has been written over the years about the matter of gun legislation in the US. And it's huge volumes and volumes, even if you read the Wikipedia, you'll find tons of explanations and legislative um, history of how people try to deal with the Second Amendment. So, but each time uh, any effort made is uh, hit by gridlocks in the Congress, nothing much will come out of all anti-gun lobbying any time in the future. And here, it's important that uh, the gun lobby is very powerful. The National Rifles Association is one of the most powerful organizations in the country. And they are very much alive to their danger to themselves of this law being changed. Therefore, they, you know, they spend tons of money to protect it. Any court of law, they protect them. And some of the most powerful people, the richest people, politicians, and others are interested in this. Strangely, 
It is believed that the ordinary people in the United States, the majority of them, are in favor of changing these laws. But that is not how it works. Somebody has to move it in the legislature, in the Congress or the Senate. Things have to move there before it comes to the ordinary people. And therefore, even the sentiment of the ordinary people may be strong. But since the legislators are often in the company of the arms lobby, and some of them are actually members. And one example is that of uh, uh, President Trump himself. He has been a great champion of the National Rifles Association. He's not only a member, but also he participates, he gives them money, even before he became president. And after he became president, he stood against any kind of rules of law, any kind of changes in the rule of law. But other presidents did not take a frontal position like that. No, but they also were not able to change the trend. And what President, former President Trump said after the Texas incident was most uh, disturbing because he said the answer to the incidents like what happened in Texas is not to remove the arms, but to give arms to everybody, including children, because they can defend themselves. Can anything be more stupid than that? Can we hand over guns to children in schools to defend themselves? So he has twisted the argument and said that uh, this case uh, justifies a more liberal law about guns. And so arming the people will be the answer uh, to the uh, situations like this. The, Ridiculous arguments such as these against gun control is based on a false sense of absolute freedom. We have come across this sense of absolute freedom and it is interpreted as the power even to commit suicide. It is part of the American, I shouldn't say culture, American habit. And, uh, you know, the recent incidents of people not wanting to wear masks or to take vaccination. Openly, they defined it, defied it. They held demonstrations. And even today, a large, large number of people in the United States neither wear masks nor take vaccination. So this is a way of expressing what is called absolute individual right. And this is not helpful for any country. So the against this risk of death, the greatest threat to human security, this absolute freedom, a concept that most Americans believe in, enable or prompts them to take such very extreme situation, extreme positions, like it happened in the case of the pandemic. The largest number of deaths occurred in the United States, partly because of this idea of uh, uh, absolute freedom, which cannot be restricted in any manner. And uh, of course, the society makes rules and regulations, but certain, certain things like arms control laws do not cope with the situation. But the polarization in the society on this subject is unbelievably strong. We might think that um, these differences are small and people may be willing to do this, but if you look at the statistics, you will find that uh, the polarization is strong and we do not have a situation where people might move on to a different uh, gun law system. Uh, there are differences in gun ownership rates by political party, affiliation, gender, geography, and other factors. For instance, 44% of Republicans and Republican leaning independents say they personally own a gun. So the Republicans, that is the richer society, people in the society who are interested in uh, uh, hunting, for example, and also interested in, you know, scared of other human beings because of the huge wealth they hold. So these are the two factors. They, they are afraid of attack by the ordinary people or by criminals, and therefore they think they need to have it. And the others are very much interested in hunting, 
and there are many competitions and there are many festivals where they want to participate. And therefore, the Republicans who are the richer people in the United States, 44% of them, uh, they personally own a gun, compared with 20% of Democrats and Democratic supporters. Of course, men are more likely than women to own a gun. 39% of men uh, owns gun, while 23% of women, only 22% only of women uh, own guns. And 41% of adults living in rural areas report owning a, a firearm, compared with about 29% of those living in the suburbs, and two in 10 living in cities. Still, it is huge. Even in the cities, two out of 10 people have, have guns. And these fall into the hands of uh, irresponsible people. It falls into the hands of children. Sometimes these things ha happen by accident. So the gun sales have risen in recent years, particularly during the pandemic. That's another strange thing. During the pandemic, when people were actually should have been afraid of the, of the virus, they were also afraid of uh, military attacks. More than half of the US population favors strict gun, gun control laws. So that is the, um, the, the peculiar thing about the United States, that if you ask individuals, 53% favors strict control laws, but the population is divided as to gun control will reduce shootings as it is believed that those who shoot are mentally deranged people who respect no loss. So this is another argument put forward by people who oppose gun laws, saying that by changing the laws, you cannot change the habits of you know, mad people. So they will in any case get hold of guns from somewhere. And this happens all over the world. Even where there are gun controls in different countries, uh, these things happen. So what we have to do is to control the um, mentally deranged people who do this. This is very true because most of these uh, incidents, finally, when the culprit is caught and uh, tried in the courts of law, it also always turns out more as an excuse rather than anything else that they were mad in that time for some particular reason. And the psychologist or somebody will help them to prove that they were in a state of frenzy or a state of uh, um, what shall we say, uh, secure insecurity. And they do that, and therefore the, no need to control the gun, guns. What you need to do is to arm everybody so that everybody can protect himself, and also set up secure barriers. That is one thing President Trump also mentioned. He said we need to protect our children by having barriers in the schools and um, gunmen deployed in order to uh, save the children and also make sure that uh, these bad people don't get into the schools. These are easier said than done because in no case has such a person been arrested or killed before he did the damage. So always the person concerned, the perpetrator is caught or shot only after he has committed the crime. So where is the question of uh, making it secure by having more fences and more security guards. So, like it happened in the United States, after 9-11, we know how much internal security has been strengthened. And it is true that the United States did not have a major terrorist attack after 9-11. So the new regulations that they brought in uh, for uh, security uh, did have an effect. And so all of us who travel to the United States have to go through this extra security and sometimes very invasive uh, security checks. And, but they don't mind about that and they very strictly control it. So it's quite possible for the United States to do that if they were politically willing to do a thing like this. Now, as you know, the security, the health, um, situation is also health uh, restrictions have also been faced. So now, traveling to the US or for that matter, any other country, 
is not a pleasure anymore because on the one hand you have the security considerations which might hold you at the airport for hours together and then this unseen enemy uh, which is the virus we are fighting against it without knowing what it is where it is how it is behaving what is likely to happen so people say why why how many more restrictions are you going to impose also suppose you are imposing restrictions about who it comes which is guaranteed by the uh, constitution so as i said president trump was unmistakably on the side of the gun lobby and even president obama could not push any legislation through but both of them initiated legislative measures which were abandoned for no good reasons after the latest shootings shootings donald trump said that the response to the shooting should be arming the people not disarming them a very ridiculous proposal rejecting calls for stricter gun controls at the national rifles association at the nra even ronald trump said that the existence of evil is one of the very best reasons to arm people so he has actually justified he said whatever restrictions you may make there will still be harmful people in the country and they cannot be controlled and then what is the point of doing this and then it will mean that the gun lobby the gun manufacturers and these are not just ordinary guns these are assault weapons one shot you can self kill many people and so in this particular case this 18 year old used an assault weapon assault rifle not an ordinary a rifle or a revolver so he said that americans should be allowed the firearms to defend themselves against it as for schools he recommended a strict security system to prevent shooting incidents again these are mere excuses to avoid changing the law of course president biden spoke movingly and blamed the gun lobbies for inhumanly preventing legislation but don't forget that he is the president of the united states he kept saying that the time had come for action but did not promise anything except rhetoric he moved his audience to tears with his words about the children but at the end he had nothing to say except say god save america and the and, and this is what uh, the president said and the gun manufacturers have spent two decades aggressively marketing assault weapons which make them the most and largest profit making companies and this is very true so he honestly said that the reason why gun control is not possible in the united states is because of the lobbying efforts of the gun manufacturers and uh, so he said for god's sake we have to have the courage to stand up to the industry here what else i know he said most americans support common sense laws common sense gun laws and left it at that a mix of passionate attachment to personal liberty i mentioned earlier one reason second profit making by gun makers third fear of fellow human beings fourth passion for hunting and fifth sheer lethargy and negligence till something serious like the shooting incident so we would also join the president saying for god's sake how many more innocent children will be sacrificed before the laws are changed sadly the only superpower stands bewildered without an answer as the rest of the world watches helplessly so this is the situation it has many dimensions it has a major political dimension a constitutional dimension a temperamental dimension the right to absolute liberty and the constitution itself has been interpreted by the supreme court in such a way and in these circumstances we cannot believe that this will end and we can only hope and pray that these things do not happen again because even if they happen i do not that the thing that the lawmakers in the united states will be able to enact laws which will prevent such bloodshed thank you
it was a series of amendments were proposed to the constitution and uh, and this was one of them but at that time it was seen as a kind of innocent amendment because it was linked to the uh, militias becoming part of a, a illegal possession of weapons to perform a particular state function but the 2008 interpretation of the supreme court is what changed the situation because they separated the law from the requirement of civil society 